When you have a neuron, you have a simple thing. It's not simple, but we'll say for our purposes. It's exceedingly sophisticated, but we'll say. And then you add lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of neurons, and now you have a more complex brain. And then you add lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of neurons, and then you have a more complex brain. Lots and lots and lots and lots of neurons, more complex, all the way, just the very same. And then when we get down here, now we have the human brain. Making sense, everyone? So from a single neuron cell through all of the various levels, I guess, if you wanted to say, of brains right through whatever it would be, I suppose, rept uh, amphibian, reptilian, avian, mammalian, and then here we are, sort of at the apex, the human brain. Okay? Are we to get, have I lost anybody yet? We've not got to the punchline yet. Have I lost anybody? Okay. So, here's the logical fallacy. Here's the logical fallacy. Is it true that going from a line to an angle to a triangle to more and more complex geometrical figures, that there are emergent properties and that I'm at a more complex thing. Is that true? Yes. Absolutely true. Okay. But here's the point. From the beginning, at any place along this continuum, okay, from the very beginning of the simplest to the very end of the most sophisticated that we can imagine, at every point you can stop, sort of butt your head in, and you have a geometrical figure. Make sense? So we go down here and we say, uh, what do we have? A geometrical figure. We go down here and we say, what, what do we have? What do we have? A geometrical figure. We go down here, what do we have? So the point is, is that at every stop along the continuum, you still are dealing with fundamentally the same thing, a geometrical figure. So far so good? Now watch. Are, are we together? Yes or no? Now watch what happens with the brain. Okay? We'll go this way. We'll say this is less complex, that's more complex. Here we start with a single cell, a neuron, and then now we're going to go, 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 go. We stop here. What do we have? An assemblage of neurons. We go, 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 go. What do we have here? What do we have here? An assemblage of neurons. We go, go, go. What do we have here? An assemblage of neurons. We go here. What do we have? An assemblage of neurons. We go here, and guess what we've got? Listen. Consciousness. Are you with me? Now, here's the tricky part. You cannot say that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain because what has emerged is fundamentally, substantively different than the sum total of the components that make the thing up. You follow? In other words, when we do our geometrical figure at every point, we have a geometrical figure here, we have one 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 here. What emerges? A very complex geometrical figure. Okay, when it comes to the brain, what do we have here? A single cell, numerous cells, more cells, still more cells, still even more cells, still more cells. And what emerges? Not a very complex arrangement of cells, but consciousness. What has emerged is itself fundamentally, substantively different from its constituent elements. So to say that the mind is an emergent property of the brain is, is like a sleight of hand. It's like a magic trick. It's a card trick. The question is, how can matter think? Do you see the logical fallacy there, yes or no? How many of us followed that? Okay, good. Basically all of us. Now, look at what we say here. This, this, is, uh, this is just quoting again uh, J.P. Moreland. The subjective character of experience is hard to capture in physicalist terms. The simple fact of consciousness is a serious difficulty for physicalism. Continuing on. Furthermore, if materialism is true, then it seems to imply, what word is that? Determinism. determinism. Now, what do you think that means? Determinism. What's the root word there? Determinism. Okay, determinism. Now, Let's, 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 let's. Now, this is where things get very interesting. They've already been interesting. They get even more interesting. Physicalism seems to imply determinism. That is, the matter or particles of which our brains are composed is subject to the laws of physics. So far, so good? These laws would determine the various brain states, thus necessarily creating states of, quote, thinking or, quote, consciousness that someone perceives to be taking place in his or her, quote, mind. An individual's personality, choices, and self-identity would all be, number one, illusory. That is, it's, it's an illusion, right? And number two, determined by various physical factors 
over which you have no control. Now, consider the words of philosopher Bertrand Russell turning the page. The first dogma which I came to disbelieve, Bertrand Russell, one of the best known atheists of sort of modern times, the first dogma which I came to disbelieve was that of the what? Free will. Free will. It seemed to me that all notions of matter were determined by the laws of dynamics and could not therefore be influenced by human wills. You see what he's saying? There's no such thing as free will. Matter is obedient to the laws of physics and there is no ghost in the machine. Notice what uh, Marvin Minsky, artificial intelligence guru, says along the same lines. Everything, including that which happens in our brains, depends only on these and only these. A set of fixed, deterministic laws, a purely random set of accidents. Okay, now this is not difficult to understand. It's difficult to believe, not difficult to understand. So, I have here a marker in my hand. I'm going to toss this marker. Okay, that marker landed exactly where it landed based on the laws of physics. If we knew all of the various elements, just like we talked about the flipping of the coin, remember? Chance is a non-entity. It possesses no ontological status. Remember that? So, so this is just a physical transaction. If you know the strength of my arm, the force of my arm, the uh, uh, air pressure, the aerodynamic um, uh, nature of the thing, you can, you can determine where that thing is going to land. It's not as though when I throw it, some other thing comes into this equation and makes that marker act in a certain way. The moment that the force is determined, the moment that the reaction is carried out, the moment that the force is, is exerted, the moment that the reaction is carried out, now watch this, the moment that marker leaves my hand, its pathway is determined by the strength and quality of the input. Does that make sense? Do you follow, yes or no? In other words, when this thing leaves my hand, how do you know where it's going to go? Well, you don't know. But if you know exactly how strong my arm is going to be, what this thing weighs, you know exactly what's going to happen. Make sense? Okay. That water bottle is matter. It's physical. It is subjected to the laws of physics. It does not have a will of its own to decide. It does not want to get thrown that way. How it's going to react in this circumstance is determined by the physical factors going in to the equation. Making sense? Amen. Your brains are the same way according to the physicalist, materialist perspective. Your brain is made up only of particles. Your brain is made up, of course, of, of atoms. Those atoms are subject to the laws of physics. The laws of physics you have no control over. The laws of physics are determining what is happening in your brain right this minute to such a degree that you do not possess free will. Are you tracking with me? That's the materialist view. And there's no escape from it. There's no escape from it. Because everything that exists is made of either matter or energy, which means that everything exists in this physical world that is bound by the laws of Newtonian and quantum physics. You are determined to be, to do, to say, and to think exactly the way you are by the laws of physics, not because of your own choice. For example, this morning I decided to wear this particular jacket. Um, I have a brown corduroy jacket that I was going to wear, but when I put it on, it just seemed to be too dark for my khakis and my light-colored shirt. I put it on, I sort of did the mirror thing, and I was like, no, it's too dark, too dark. So then I put this one on, and I thought, you know, I've never been a big fan of gray and khaki. It doesn't really, it's not one of my favorites, but I didn't have another jacket that worked, and I wore my khaki jacket yesterday and a khaki jacket with the khaki pants. That's not going to work because you have light-colored khaki. Dark. The khakis don't match. The patterns, ah, it's not going to work. So, so I chose to wear this. I think I did a fine job. I mean, I think, I think I'm looking all right, right? My wife told me so when I left the house this morning. Now, the point here... Is that, is that subjective or... Yeah. Oh, m m my handsomeness is obviously objective. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so now don't miss this. Everything I just said to you, everything I just said to you is total 
balderdash, total poppycock, total rubbish if materialism is true, because I didn't choose to wear this. I didn't choose to start a school of evangelism. I didn't choose to sit down and, and have lunch with Bonnie. I didn't choose to eat that. I didn't choose to. I have never chosen to do anything. I am dancing to my DNA. I'm determined genetically, and I'm dancing to my atoms, molecules, etc. Every one of us is determined by, and there's no escape from this. There's no escape from this. If you are only a physical entity, then you are subject to physical processes, and there is no escape from the effect that physical processes have on physical entities. You are determined, which is what Bertrand Russell, by the way, well, let me back up here, which is what Bertrand Russell is saying right there. He says, the first thing that I had to doubt was the dogma of free will. Okay, are we all together on this? Now, let's follow this through. I've got a couple questions, but I want to I get this right through this, and then I'll take your questions, because some of this might answer your questions. Assert assertions such as these raise many fundamental questions, such as, how would a society justly punish criminals on this view, since personal responsibility and personal choice are non-existent? Would punishing someone for something that they had no choice but to do be moral? In other words, Get over the idea that we're punishing criminals for their immoral acts. If they had no choice but to do those things, how can we, as a moral society, lock them up? That itself would be determined. Look at the next one. How can we laud the acts of heroism, sacrifice, magnanimity, and virtue that we as civilized people hold in such high esteem? These two were determined by strictly physical factors. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., William Wilberforce, Gandhi, Jesus Christ, and all other paragons of virtue were not so virtuous after all. Amen. Their lives and their deeds were determined by the laws of physics acting on a physical entity, the brain. Surely this view can be rejected as absurd and completely out of sync with what we all know is reality. Are we ready to abandon ideas such as virtue, kindness, goodness, self-determination, and personal responsibility, as well as so much more? If we affirm a strictly materialistic universe, we are forced to do just that. Are we together, everyone? Yes or no? Does this make sense, what we've said here? Okay, so basically we're talking about, number one, can the, can the mind be an emergent property of the brain? The answer is apparently no. There appears to be a logical fallacy there because simply having a more and 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 more complex assemblage of neurons, what emerges is not a very, very, very complex set of neurons. What emerges is consciousness. And this is substantively different from the stuff of which it's made. You tracking with me? Do protons think? Do neurons think? By the way, there are some sort of... Um, uh, radical fringe uh, philosophers, materialist philosophers, that actually are beginning to embrace the idea that all things have consciousness. Yeah, they're basically trying to um, remove uh, humanity from its privileged pedestal of being self-aware, and they're saying trees are self-aware, and lights are self-aware. And even ecosystems are self-aware. And grass is self-aware. And rocks are self-aware. Everything is self-aware. Even if we create it, it's self-aware? Yeah, absolutely, because it's made of matter. In other words, the, the idea here is that, is that awareness is, a, is, is, is part of, is interwoven with matter in certain arrangements. Now, of course, we reject that. We reject that out of hand. We reject that based on experiential grounds. We reject that on so many levels, but you get the point. Now, the second thing we've talked about here is this whole notion of determinism. Does this make sense? Does it make sense what we're saying here? How if the brain is strictly a physical organ, that it is subject to the various physical laws and, and uh, processes of physics, and there is no escape from it. Does that make sense? Yes. Everyone, yes or no? Okay. Now, Let's talk, uh, before we close this session, about the miracle of an intelligible universe, 
which you've got right there in front of you. Not only do we have minds, not only do we have an amazing universe, but we have minds that are able to grasp and understand their place in that universe. Now this element of the universe's intelligibility is something that has absolutely impressed some of the greatest minds that have ever lived, uh, one of whom was Albert Einstein. Let's see what Einstein said about this. Uh, this is from Letters to Solovine, New York Philosophical Library, 1987, page 131. He's writing and he says to a friend, you find it strange that I consider the comprehensibility of the world to the extent that we are authorized to speak of such a comprehensibility as a miracle or an eternal mystery. Well, a priori, one should expect a chaotic world which cannot be grasped by the mind in any way. The kind of order created by Newton's theory of gravitation, for example, is totally different. Even if man proposes the axioms of the theory, the success of such a project presupposes a high degree of ordering of the objective world, and this could not be expected a priori. That is the miracle which is being constantly reinforced as our knowledge expands. You follow his line of reasoning? He's writing to a friend and he says, you think it's strange that I consider the comprehensibility of the world to be a miracle or an eternal mystery. He says, why should the universe be understandable? Why should the universe be comprehensible? That's not what we would expect a priori. Do we all understand a priori? Okay. A priori. Basically, what does the word prior mean? Before. Yeah, it means before. So a priori just means before. This is something that we would expect beforehand. It's a presupposition. Something that you bring to the table a priori is something that you bring prior to your interaction with something. You say, you know, I bring this to the table. That's what I'm bringing to the table. So what Einstein is saying is uh, we would expect before experience, we would expect what we would bring to the table is an anticipation that the world would be, the universe would be totally incomprehensible. But lo and behold, it's comprehensible. He says to me, this is a mystery. Why should it be? This is a variation of the quotation that I've given to you twice before. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is precisely its comprehensibility. The most amazing thing about the universe is that there are minds here to appreciate its amazingness. Okay, that's my paraphrase. Notice the second one here. This one's from Eugene Wigner. He won the Nobel Prize in 1963. He wrote a widely quoted paper titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Physical Science Sciences. In it, he points out that scientists often take for granted the remarkable, even miraculous effective effectiveness of mathematics in describing the real world. Here is an excerpt. This is a marvelous, marvelous quotation. See if you can follow it. He says, Dr. Wigner says, the enormous usefulness of mathematics is something bordering on the what? Mysterious. On the mysterious. <clears throat> there is no rational explanation for it. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language for mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Now look at, look at our comment here. Mathematics appears to give us real information about the world. How else can we get a man to the moon and back or have iPods and cell phones and satellite television turning the page? The answer in part is that there are real physical laws that physicists are discovering and describing. Physicists don't make up the laws of physics. They discover them. In other words, they were there before they were found out. The universe exhibits these law-like characteristics. When the discoveries of physics are combined with the language and application of mathematics, the universe begins to make excellent sense. But why should this be? And that's Wigner's question, and that's Einstein's question. Make sense? In other words, math is telling us obviously something about the external world. It's not just an internally consistent game. Uh, you take the laws of physics with the language of math, you put it together, and we can get a person to the moon, and we can get him back. That tells you that math is telling you something 
about the real world. Are you tracking with me? And what Einstein is saying is, why should the universe be this comprehensible? Why should the universe be understandable? We would expect it to be chaotic. We would expect it to be unintelligible, ununderstandable. In fact, if I could take this just a little further, a marvelous book that you might want to read sometime, won't be on the bibliography list, but it's good, is titled The Soul of Modern Science by Jeffrey Paxson. And basically what Mr. Paxson shows, and this is well documented, is that the founders of the modern scientific method were almost all theists, and most of them were Christians. Do you track with that? The founders of the modern scientific method, people like Galileo, Copernicus, Kelvin, Kepler, uh, th these, these are the people that founded the modern scientific method. And what, what Jeffrey Paxson says, it's not very politically correct, I'll tell you that. But what he says is fascinating. He says, look at all of the cultures. The only cultures that have given rise to the scientific enterprise are monotheistic cultures. And the main culture that has given rise to the scientific enterprise is Protestant Christianity. You tracking? The Reformation is sort of 15th century, 16th century, uh, even part of the 14th century. So 14th, 15th, 16th century, that's the Protestant Reformation. My friends, I have news for you. That's also the birth of modern science. And the reason that, that Paxson gives is basically this. He says that there were these various presuppositions, these various assumptions about the nature of the universe that had to be in place in order for science to get started. One of them was that matter isn't evil. Right? That is a major teaching in many Eastern religions, that matter is evil. And, and there's all kinds of superstitions that surround matter. When, when, when Christians began to look at the material world, they said, no way, matter's not evil. It was made by God. God is a God of order. God is a God of laws. And therefore, we would expect the universe to have orderly, law-like characteristics. And so the founders, the Newtons, the progenitors of the modern scientific method went looking for order that they just knew would be there because they knew that God had put order into the very fiber and fabric of the universe. And that gave rise to the modern scientific method. Method. Prior to that, you don't really have it. Does that make sense? And so that's sort of an extension of what Wigner and Einstein are saying. What they're saying is, why should the universe be intelligible? Why should the universe be understandable? To Newton and others, this screamed divinity, this screamed order, this screamed God. And so let's try and put this, um, as we wrap this section up here, this section on mind. Let's just read this quotation from Dr. Gingrich and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, we've read this before, but he says, to me, belief in a final cause, a creator God, gives a coherent understanding of why the universe seems so congenially designed for the existence of what kind of life? Intelligent, Intelligent and what? Self-reflective Self life. It would take only small changes and numerous physical constants to render the universe uninhabitable. Somehow, in the words of Freeman Dyson, this is the universe that knew we were coming. So, so I've said this before, but I want to write it on the board as I look for my marker here, or my eraser, and hopefully we can sort of get our, our um, fingers wrapped around the force of this point. We're not just talking about the existence of minds, but look at how some of the points are coming together now. When we looked at life, one of the things that we noted was the anthropic principles. Are we together? Yes or no? It looks like the universe had man in mind. In other words, we live in an amazingly fine-tuned universe. So far, so good? Yes or no? Okay, here's the question. Do chickens know this? Okay, thank you, Mike, for correcting Chris's foolishness. Of course, chickens do not know this. Okay, chickens don't know this. Earthworms don't know this. Not even chimpanzees are alleged simian cousins or brothers. They don't know this. Who alone knows that we live in an amazingly fine-tuned universe? Human beings do. Okay, so... If there wasn't a human mind here to appreciate this, it would never be known. Okay, so what Einstein is saying, and what Wigner is saying, and what Gingrich is saying, 
it is very much the thing that the, that the founders of the modern scientific method thought. And that is, the universe has meaning, the universe has order, the universe was built by a God that, that put into it order and meaning and structure, and lo and behold, here is a mind, a human mind, that can grasp this basic concept. And to quote C.S. Lewis again, surely this ought to raise our suspicions. So, so notice how these two are coming together now. Life and mind are now coalescing together to make a very powerful, if I could use the term, emergent apologetic. And that is not just that we live in an amazing universe, and not just that there are minds, but there, that there are the kinds of minds who can appreciate the universe in which we live. And that's what Gingrich just said. He said, to, to me, uh, uh, belief in a final cause of Creator God gives a coherent understanding of why the universe seems so congenially designed for intelligent, self-reflective life. Are we together on this? The mind is here to grasp the universe's intricacies, beauties, and glories. Can you say amen to that? And by the way, that's science. That's science. The founders of the modern scientific method were driven in their scientific enterprises to know God. Surely you know that Isaac Newton was a committed Christian and wrote as much on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation as he ever did on physics. These men were driven, many of them, to think God's thoughts after him. They knew that God had done it in a law-like, orderly, amazing, astounding way, and they wanted to discover the way that God had made the universe. So not only do you have an amazing universe, not only do you have a well-structured, anthropically uh, uh, fine-tuned and precise universe, you have minds that can say, aha. So we can wrap up mind. Here we go. Then we'll take a question. Keep it simple, saints. It's right there on your check marks. Number one, say it with me. The mind and the brain are not the same thing. Number two, they are interrelated but not identical. Number three, the mind and consciousness are best accounted for in a theistic worldview. Number four, if materialism is true, then determinism appears inescapable. This flies in the face of conventional understandings of morality, virtue, and justice. And finally, the comprehensibility of the universe strongly suggests purpose and divine origin for both the universe and the minds that can grasp its characteristics, operations, and vastness. Okay, now it's taken us two hours to get through this. Um, don't feel like that's a long time. Many people dedicate their lives to it. It's taken us two hours to get through this, but I do want to ask, do we understand broadly the apologetic point of mind? Yes or no? Okay, and we'll just close briefly with this. Here's our two universes. Here's our non-theistic universe. Here's our theistic universe. We're asking the question, which of these two universes best explains the existence of the mind and a universe that can be grasped by the mind? Or I should say a mind that can grasp the universe. No question, it's this universe. There's just no question. No question at all that this is totally counterintuitive and flies in the face of our own personal experience and self-identity and awareness. Okay? So here we are again. Time, best explained here. That is to say, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe has a cause. That causes the uncaused cause of all things God. Best explained here. Life, the origin of life, best explained here. A universe uh, that is designed for the existence and maintenance and diversity of life, best explained here. The mind, both as an entity and as an entity that exists in a universe that is crying out to be grasped, studied, and understood, best explained here. You can begin to see... I believe we're beginning to see the strength of the Christian position and the theistic position. Amen? Now, can people still believe this? Sure, absolutely. Let's just split it down the middle. Let's say it's 50-50. Let's say 
that I've just given you a biased representation of these things and someone else could come in and give you an equally, per equally persuasive representation of the other perspective. I, I don't think they could. Not that they're not as they could be far more intelligent, far more educated, but the bottom line is, is that I've read the data, I've read the books, and I just cannot consent to someone telling me that my love for my daughter, or my love for my wife, my love for my sons, my, my love for, for, for the people, my love for Benny, my sense of who I am is attributable to jelly-like substance between my ears. I reject that. And I think you do too. Amen. If someone wants to believe this, they are welcome to believe this. But the point is this. This takes... And this takes... Both take faith. Both are faith propositions. Again, disabuse your mind of this idea that this is science, this is facts, this is evidence, and this is feeling faith and emotion. Au contraire, mon frere. This is a faith position, this is a faith position. Both require faith. What I'm trying to present here is that this is actually the position of greater faith. This is the position of more reasonability and rationality. Okay? So far, so good? A couple questions, then we'll break. Christopher. Do animals have minds? Well, let me say this about that. Animals do not have minds in the same way that we have minds. For example, um, some of the things that set us apart, not just as, as differences of degree, but of substance are language. That's a big one. Um, the arts. That's a big one. Creative thought. And um, there's some really basic things, things like we know that we will die. We have self-awareness. It is highly unlikely that animals have an awareness that they will someday die. They don't, they don't contemplate their own mortality. Now, having said that, um, Ellen White actually says, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but Ellen White actually says in the plainest of language that animals can love. And it's, it's, I think it's absolutely believable. I think that in their own wonderful um, I hate to use the word simple because I don't think it is simple, but in their own wonderful, unique way, animals do possess emotional capacities. You can look it right up. Uh, just type it. No, now that's a good question, even fish. What ends up happening is that you basically have different degrees or different levels of brain. Now, you're, you're not talking, I'm not a Piscine neurologist, of course, but based on, based on broadly in answer to your question, fish do not have, from my understanding, uh, 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 prefrontal cortex. Is that right? I don't, I don't think fish have the top part of the brain. They basically have the bottom part of the brain, the brain stem, their reactionary. Uh, they, they don't have any of the locations that we think, that we meditate, that we hope, that we dream, character, anticipation, fear. They don't, they don't appear to have any of that. Dogs are obviously more sophisticated than fish. Far more sophisticated. You can have a pet fish, but it will never come when you call it. Okay? Someone once quipped that God gave us dogs so that we could know what converted people are like, and he gave us cats so that we could know what unconverted people are like. So you basically have, you have unconversion and conversion. Because a dog, you know, you accidentally, you know, hurt it or, or slam the door on its paw or something, and two seconds later it's just... <laughs> A cat, you know, you do one thing wrong it doesn't like, and it scratches you and runs off, and so you have converted and unconverted. I, I'm not advocating that or, or, or not, but I'm just saying that uh, there's different levels of, of sophistication. Yeah, there are some very, very sophisticated animals. And of course, those of you that love animals, you've heard some of these stories, you know, animals getting dropped off hundreds of miles from their homes and then making their, ways ba making their way back. Or uh, there's uh, many stories of dolphins leading ships through treacherous waters and uh, circuitous uh, passageways. So there's no question that animals have some capacity to love, but they don't have a mind in terms of a, a moral understanding in the same way that you and I have uh, moral capacity. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially if you give them fish. <laughs> Benny. That, that's, a, that's a good point you bring out there. Sometimes people will say to me, you know, how can you fish? You're into fishing. You know, these fish are trying to swim away from you. You're hurting them or whatever. But there's a difference between fear, apprehension of fear, and what's called nociception. I think it's called nociception. And nociception is basically responsive, intuitive um, reaction to perceived danger. 
But fear is a product of the brain. It's, it's a product of awareness of situation, uh, a sense of your own mortality, and then fear is a product of that. Fear takes place in the frontal brain. Same with judgment, same with morality. So there are analogies to animal life, but, but obviously animal life was not made in the image of God, number one. And uh, I think I gave you that quotation from... I read this quotation as part of my uh, sermon on hostility and um, hunger. Did you hear that quotation from Berlinski? Let me just read it to you again here. He's talking about apes. And he says, The idea that human beings have been endowed with powers and properties not found elsewhere in the animal kingdom or the universe, so far as we can tell, arises from a simple imperative. Just look around. It is an imperative that survives the invitation fraternally to consider the great apes. The apes are, after all, behind the bars of their cages, and we are not. Eager for the experiments to begin, they are impatient for their food to be served. They seem impatient for little else. After years of punishing trials, a few of them have been taught the rudiments of various primitive symbol systems. Having been, gift the, have, having been, having been given the gift of language, they what? They have nothing to say. When two simian prodigies meet, they fling their signs at one another. More is, ex more is expected, but more is rarely forthcoming. It says, beyond what we have in common with the apes, we have nothing in common. And while the similarities are interesting, the differences are profound. Okay? And then also, this is a, another similar line of reasoning here. I think you'll find this very interesting. Speaking of this very same thing, Jonathan Mark says... Uh, for all the interest generated by the sign language experiments with apes, three things are clear. First, they do, not ha they do have the capacity to manipulate a symbol system given to them by humans and to communicate with it. Two, unfortunately, they have nothing to say. Three, they do not use such system in the, any such system in the wild. You see how it's working? Okay, pretty simple. You can teach your dog to sit in the prey position. You cannot teach your dog to pray. Okay? Any other questions before we take a break? Okay, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about ought. Time, life, mind, ought. Okay?